Today we're in Romans, we're in Romans chapter four in our truth for the end time. We're going in a parallel track back and forth between Romans and Revelation. And, and before we get into that, I wanna tell you how to pray uh, because I'm gonna have us pray and then uh, things that I would like us to be praying for over the next four weeks because we are four weeks away from Easter. We are just four weeks away from Easter Sunday. And there are three things specifically I'd like you to be asking God for with me. Number one, I want to preach with power, so I wish you'd pray that I would preach with power on that Sunday. It's not a typical, I do not have planned a typical Easter Sunday sermon, not looking at the typical Easter Sunday passages or resurrection. I, I kind of want God to hit us more on uh, what should be, what should our life be now that Jesus rose from the dead. And it's very outreach and evangelistic in that sense. I, our harvest teams are now going, I want you to be able to invite people to come with you or watch us online, especially for Easter. So I, I wish you would pray. I'd be able to preach with power. Second, I want you to ask for a movement of the Holy Spirit in your own life. Certainly on that Sunday and on these four weeks leading up to Easter, ask God for a movement of the Holy Spirit in your own life. And then third, I would like us as a church to have what I'm calling a working Easter. I'd like us to have a working Easter and two components to that. One is our harvest teams, which some of which uh, have already met, I think two, maybe two or three of the dozen or so that we have going have met at this time. And the report I got back this morning is that even just from those groups that have met, 63 people are being prayed for in terms of salvation. So when you line yourself up with one of those teams and you get a chance to meet, everyone is able to share the people they are coming in contact with that they would like to elicit prayer from the rest of the team. And also, I think all of the teams are creating like a, a text group uh, so that whenever you do meet with someone, like in the moment, you can text the rest of the people in your group and say, hey, be, be praying, I'm meeting with so-and-so. And, and so we've got already have 63 people intentionally being prayed for, for salvation. And over the next four weeks, as the groups meet, our one goal between now and Easter is to teach you and to show you and even give you a practice time and train you in how to deliver your own testimony, how to give your own testimony about how you came to Christ. And that's just the one goal between now and Easter for our harvest teams. But secondly, second, the second thing, you know, I, I, was, I was thinking and praying about this, you know, it'd be nice to have a working Easter. And then maybe a month ago, I don't know if you saw this, there was a news uh, news cast talked about the fact that they had a major sex trafficking bust up in uh, St. Joseph. So the Missouri Highway Patrol and undercover detectives and so forth, and they had a big bust against sex trafficking up in St. Joseph. Not that it's not in other parts of our state or particularly uh, places where we're at, like right along the I-70 corridor. And I thought, you know, if we could do something with that, and Restoration House is just south of us in Harrisonville. And they, they, only, they have a very limited number of beds. And Dr. Rodney Hammer, who is chairman of their board for that, was telling me they had 600 requests from State Highway Patrol and other places to, to be able to place people with them who are survivors of sex trafficking to keep them out of it and get them acclimated, you know, back to regular normal life. And 600 requests and they could only uh, handle a few of those. They referred 200 of those 600, but that was still just huge numbers. So Restoration House is trying to expand from basically only about five beds right now to 16. And so I thought, wow, let's make this a working Easter. Let's say that we're gonna outfit Two of the new rooms at $3,000 each. Let's see if we can raise $6,000 over the next four weeks. It'll be a working Easter. And, and so much so that this cross that is behind me, we're gonna fill it with something. Well, we're gonna fill the middle with something as funds come in so you can see how close we are. So I'm not sure exactly how that's gonna be done, but we're gonna, I'm gonna give you a visual representation. I'd like us to have a working Easter in that way and um, maybe other things we can do as well. I know some of our ladies out of the church have already had contact with them and 
taking some things down to them. So we, got, we, we have things going on, but uh, I'd like us to do that. So stand, if you will. Let's have a word of prayer as we get ready to get into uh, Romans chapter 4. Father, I thank you today. I thank you that, uh, Lord, last weekend I was able to go and represent this church at Pastor Mark Trotter's funeral. And Lord, what a great send-off for Pastor Mark. And uh, Lord, to likewise be able to bring back greetings, not just from New Philadelphia, Ohio, but practically everybody in Atlanta who, who also is up there and many other places. And uh, Father, we thank you. Uh, we thank you for the memory of those who challenge us with their life that they had following you. And Lord, we want to we wanna go on. We want to move on. We want to make this the best Easter possible in our lives, for our families, Lord, in the loss that we're in contact with, even this entire community. And so, God, we put that out there before you. We ask it not because we're worthy, but, but because we're your people, not because we deserve it, but because of what Christ did. Be with us today as we look into Romans chapter 4 together. We ask it in Jesus' precious and powerful name. Amen. Thank you. you may be seated in the Lord's presence. If you look at Romans chapter 4, Paul is going to talk about Abraham. And Abraham is the human father of the Jews. In other words, the Hebrew, uh, he, Hebrew tribe. And Abraham's father of that. And so to, to most Jews, he's the most revered, most respected patriarch and uh, uh, maybe even the most uh, uh, perfect man who ever lived. And that's why Paul chooses him as the best example of a person who gets saved and justified by faith. And Paul needs to open a window on that word of salvation by faith to us because he knows he's debating in terms of the persons who are reading he, his epistle. He's debating with people who are hard shell, legalistic Jewish audiences and pagan audiences who don't understand. And now he's got to deal with the most important question that arises in our last days. How do I get out of this mess? How do I get saved? How do I get wholeness back? How do I get health? How do I get deliverance? And like many of your friends, family, and neighbors, the Jews were confused. They'd been deceived by the devil, first about how sick they were, second about what their need was, and third about how to get cured. Because there is this rule of life in the Old Testament called the law. Now, we mainly recognize it in terms of the Ten Commandments. And the Ten Commandments were simply God's baseline standard for humanity. Today, the rule is grace. Because it go, but grace goes beyond law all the way to love. And grace is the finished work of Christ, all the merit due from his own righteousness operating on your behalf as you place your faith and trust in Jesus for salvation. That is the fix. You see it right here. Look at Romans 4, verses 1 to 5. Verse, uh, verse 2, if Abraham were justified by works, well then he hath whereof the glory, but not before God. For one, what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and believing God was counted unto him for righteousness. So, verse 4, now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. And God's not going to be in your debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. So here's, here's our thesis for today's study. Grace is now our all-consuming guideline for living. Old Testament saints lived under the law. We live under grace. But now here's the dealio. The law was a rule of life, but it did not impart eternal life. It couldn't do that. It couldn't give that. I mean, the law was the way they proved they were sinners when they broke it, and when they kept it, it was the way they proved they had faith. So Paul needs this illustration. He needs a biblical example to show us that God's righteousness has always been by faith in what God says. You know, most people in our end times, they do not understand this truth. They think that getting into heaven is like the gymnast that does his or her routine out on the floor. And then they go to wait for the score of the judges. And the judges score their performance, and 
and they see 6.0, 6.0, 0 0.1, that was from the Russian judge. And then the best performers get the medals on the platform and the lazy performers don't even get to climb the stairs. And, and so most of your network of neighbors, family, and friends fully expect that if there is a heaven, they've, they've got to get into it on that same type of system. You try your best, you let God give you the score, and those who don't mess up too much, well, you get in. And what a relief it is when a person finally understands that, that we are not saved and we do not get into heaven based upon our performance. We are saved by faith to, to simply believe in the performance of Jesus Christ on our behalf. And when you think about it, if Satan really wanted to wreak havoc with our country, what better way to do it than to attack the truth about faith. I mean, what better thing than to fill churches with false teaching on the most essential ingredient of the Christian life? So this Sunday, we devote ourselves to the doctrine of dynamic faith. But since you're not as emotional over this as, as I need you to be, can I go ahead and ex give you an experiential explanation of what faith is not? So we're going to examine Paul's example of biblical life-fulfilling faith, well, let's contrast it with what we're seeing in American society today and what, you, what, what one documentarian has called the American gospel. Because first off, notice if you will, this is number one, to name it and claim it, that is not faith. I mean, I listen to those people too, and they talk about how, well, they're a child of the king and God wants them to be wealthy and enjoy all the luxuries of life. So, so go to the dealership, pick out your Lexus or Escalade, uh, name it, then sow a financial seed in their ministry, some amount you can pro probably not really afford, and sow it into their ministry there online, and by doing that, well, you're claiming what you have named, so much so that at some point after that, God's going to bless you, and you're going to be able to go back to that dealership and pay cash for that car. Now, can I be honest with you? Okay, I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> I put the name it and claim it, the, the blab it and grab it, the tag it and bag it crowd right in that same category as payday lenders and those people who take your title and will not give it back. See, some people even call that the prosperity gospel as if the gospel were about material prosperity. So second, second on the other hand, this is number two, to give verbal confession alone. That's not biblical faith. I mean, false teachers for our end times propagate the false truth that your words, not God's word, your words have creative power. It's not the word of God that does the work, but you can write your own ticket based on what you say. And what you say is going to determine everything that happens. Now, can I be honest with you? Okay, I'm going to do it anyway. The false truth propagated in our end times is that if you simply speak positive words, it will create a positive reality. No, baby Baba. See, this is our first point for study. If you want positive reality in your life, then you're going to have to apply Bible principles over time with the assistance of an ungrieved Holy Ghost. Hello, somebody. But for the false prophets of the false faith persuasions, faith is not believing God. It's not trusting on God. It's not waiting on God's providence. For them, faith is a formula. And it's a formula for manipulating spiritual laws. But that is not biblical faith. And finally, this is number three, self-generated belief. That ain't biblical faith. Faith is not convincing yourself to believe something so that it can become reality in your life. And that's the cop out every faith healer in existence. Well, why didn't I get healed of my cancer when you healed all those people with crutches, wheelchairs, and medical boots? Well, for one thing, because they are the actors I hired that came in on the bus with me. But second, it's because you didn't believe strong enough. And it's not because I don't have the gift of healing. It's because you don't have enough faith, meaning self-generated belief. 
Well, the faith healer looks like a hero whenever it appears that a miracle occurs. But he or she is not to be blamed if someone is missing an eye or a limb, and yet they are kept a, a mile distance away from coming up on the platform. See, we need Paul's truth for our end times. Otherwise, people put, put, put faith in their own faith and try to get saved by faith in their own faith or faith in the faith healer instead of faith in Jesus. See, watch. Psalm 37, verse 4 on your handout says, Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. So God will give you the desires generated by delighting in him, in his word, in his will, in his work, in his way. Uh, it does not say God will give you your impulse desires. So do not go jumping off the pinnacle of the temple just to prove your faith, because in reality, you're tempting God when you do that. Trust him to build a staircase down, then walk down it. So let me take you back to our text, because I believe we can work through each of these problematic false truths to get us back to God's truth for our end times, and it will not only build you, it will bless your family, it will fuel your outreach. It, it, you know, in the time we have left, until Jesus comes, it'll give us just what we need to get to others. So, uh, so, so look at Romans chapter 4. Let's see what Paul says about Abraham to define biblical doctrine of true dynamic faith. Verse 16, therefore righteousness is of faith that it might be by grace to the end the promise might be sure to all the seed, not to that only which is of the law, the physical seed of Abraham, the Hebrews, the Jews, but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham, the seed, which is his seed because of the same type of faith he had, who is the father of us all. Watch, as it is written, I, here's what God wrote about Abraham. I have made thee a father of many. Whoa, whoa, wait, hold it. What's the next word? Nation, that's the word for Gentiles. Uh, can you believe that? God says he's going to make Abraham the father of many Gentiles, before whom Abraham believed, even believed God, who quickeneth the dead, and calleth those things which be not as though they were. God does that. But because God does that, then Abraham, verse 18, against hope, believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations according to that which was spoken. So shall thy seed be. He hung on to the word of God given to him, so shall thy seed be. Now clearly Abraham did not become the father of Isaac through whom his physical promised seed was to come. When he was 100 years old, Sarah was 90, just because he got a whim and he found some vim because he found a little blue pill. He also did not name it and claim it. As a matter of fact, verse 19 says, being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead when he was about 100 years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. So Abraham became the father of Isaac even after it was humanly possible because God named it and Abraham believed it because God made a promise and hopeless Abraham believed in that hope given him in God's word. Because verse 20, he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God and being fully persuaded that what he had promised, God was also able to perform. So Abraham's a father of the faith, Israel's and ours, not because of any of his words, but because of God's word to him in Genesis 12, verses 2 and 3. And God said that to Abraham, not the other way around, because biblical faith is not self-generated belief. Now, I want you to go back to verse 20. Go back to verse 20 of Romans 4 and underline either virtually, mentally, or really four words, was strong in faith. How does that happen, I wonder? Well, let me give you four. Zechariah 8 Verse 13, and it shall come to pass that as ye were a curse among the heathen, O house of Judah and house of Israel, so will I save you and ye shall be a blessing. Fear not, but let your hands be strong. 
So your hands gain strength by you refusing to fear. Okay, Haggai 2, verse 4. Yet now be strong, O Zerubbabel, saith the Lord. Be strong, O Joshua, son of Josedek, the high priest. Be strong, all ye people of the land, saith the Lord, and work. For I am with you, saith the Lord of hosts. I can be strong and work when I acknowledge the fact that God is with me. So Paul says in 2 Corinthians 12, verse 10, Therefore I take pleasure in infirmities in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in pandemics, in mask mandates, in distresses, for Christ's sake, for when I am weak, then am I strong. Now, I know you didn't see that one coming, but it's based on this simple truth of 2 Timothy 2, verse 1. Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. So let's tie this truth down to our own end times by taking it back from here in Romans. And let's don't go forward to Revelation. Let's go back to another prophetic book, the book of Daniel, chapter 11, verse 32. And it is a prophetic passage here in Daniel 11, verse 32, and says, And such as do wickedly against the covenant shall he, and the he, in context, historically, was the king of the north, and in history, that, that was Antiochus Epiphanes. Now, prophetically, or doctrinally, it is the Antichrist. He shall corrupt by flatteries, but the people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. Abraham didn't strengthen himself. Abraham's faith was made strong by four things, and this is how we make strong our faith. Refusing to fear acknowledging God's presence, taking pleasure in pressure, and then, t and then taking the grace that God supplies us in Jesus. Know God, and you know the dynamics of biblical faith even in our end times, because Abraham's entire life was affected by the fact that he believed God and trusted God's word. That changed life and the outcome of life for Abraham. And that is saving faith because Paul says in chapter 4, verse 22, and therefore it, being fully persuaded of God's promises, it was imputed to him for righteousness. Righteousness was reckoned to his account by faith. Have you put your faith in Jesus? Have you given up on human effort? Human willpower, human reasoning, human rationalization, human justification, self-actualization. I mean, I'm just saying, this one thing, if you do this, it'd solve your panic attacks, all your anxiety. Give up on that. Trust in the finished work of Christ. What about the next time that you were about to freak out over things? Now, if you, you know, I don't know if you're under 30, if you know what freaking out is. But what if the next time you're about to freak out, you just said, you know what? I'm going to put all of this right on the finished work of Christ. I don't I need to worry about this. I'm going to trust in his finished work. I don't know how it's going to work for me right now, but I know it's going to work. Everybody believes something, but if you believed in Jesus, I mean, you believe something about life, death, and the afterlife. I know, I know you do, but do you believe God's word and what it says about life, death, and, and life after death? I mean, you trust doctors who tell you you have a disease you never heard of, write a prescription you cannot read, take it to a pharmacist you do not know, who gives you a liquid that tastes like poison, and then you go back for a refill. So I cannot let you leave here without showing you the four critical characteristics of saving faith. And what I mean is the faith that will bring you to God, the faith that brings you eternal life before your life ends, the faith that brings you truth for today. Anybody wants to hear this, just give me a one-way sign. Just be a hippie today, like the Jesus freaks. One way, Jesus is the way. Okay, I'll even take paralysis as consent. This is the faith that saves souls, restores families, reaches the lost. In Romans 1, we saw the heathen sinner. In chapter 2, we saw the Hebrew sinner. 
In chapter 3, we see the wages of sin, which is death. But here is Paul's dynamic doctrine about saving faith. So first off, notice, if you will, this is number one. Saving faith has a divine object. It has to have a divine object. And that's why faith is essential to your spiritual health, psychological health, mental, emotional health, and well-being. I mean, every other fix you find is only going to be the best that a lost man can do on a good day. So what better place for the devil to level an attack than at the most essential element of the Christian universe? You know, a lot of people have natural faith, but they don't have saving faith. You drink water out of a water fountain believing it's safe. Okay, that's natural faith, but it's not saving faith because it does not have a divine object. Natural faith relies on human reason and physical senses, but the dynamic of saving faith is that it relies on a conviction about and a trust in a supernatural person. And God himself was the object of Abraham's faith. You see that right there in verse 3, Romans 4, for what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and that is what was counted to him for righteousness. He had complete trust in the reliability of God's righteousness versus his own, of God's work to provide that righteousness versus any work he could do to try and merit it, and all the counterfeits and all the corruptions. They have faith working backwards. So, so all of the word of faith movement has reversed the thrusters of faith because instead of God speaking and we trust what what he says, they have you speaking and God being bound by what you say. Turn to Matthew 17 or look at it there on your handout because in Matthew 17, the apostles did not have enough faith to be faith healers one time because 10 of them were... uh, Nine of them were left at the bottom of a mountain while Jesus and and the three closest to him went to the top. So now their, their, their most efficient road dogs are taken away from them. Jesus himself is physically outside of their sight. And now they run into a seemingly insurmountable person and and they can't, they don't have enough faith to be faith healers. So Jesus, when he gets down, he does the job for him, And then he, they ask him, they ask Jesus and say, look, why couldn't we cast out that devil and heal that sore, vexed, lunatic child? And Jesus says in Matthew 17, 20, because of your unbelief. I wasn't here. I was gone. I wasn't with you. And you got your object wrong. <laughs> you put your object on yourself trying to get this done. You can't do that. I have to be your object. For verily I say unto you, if you have faith, well, meaning faith in me, as a grain of mustard seed, ye shall say unto this mountain, remove hence to yonder place, and it shall move, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. So it's clearly not the quantity of your faith, but the object of your faith. You you must be in God to do the work of God and have the faithfulness of Christ to carry you through. And in this case, they needed, they needed to place faith in that object of Christ doing the work through prayer and fasting, Jesus says. So here's what you must do. Hebrews 12. Look at Hebrews 12 on your handout, verses 1 and 2. Here's what you got to do. Lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking Unto the object of faith, Jesus. He's both the author, but he's also the finisher. Job said, though God slay me, yet will I trust in him. So second, on the other hand, number two, saving faith has a divine foundation. Verse 18, that tells us that Abraham, against hope, believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations, not just Israel, according to that which was spoken and what God had spoken was, so shall thy seed be. So the key is in believing, not what some charlatan says, but in that which is spoken by God. So faith is not a means of getting your selfish will done in heaven, getting heaven to agree with your selfish will. 
It is a means for getting God's stated will accomplished here on planet Earth. Because here's our second point for study. Faith is a present confidence in the future reality described in God's word. So dynamic biblical faith is based on what God says in his word, not what somebody else says to you. And Abraham always acted on the word he received. You can see that in verses 19 to 21. I mean, he was told to leave his hometown and just follow God. Go someplace else. He wasn't even told where, and he left. He was told that Sarah would have a biological child of their own, and they did. He was told to seal the covenant to the following generations through circumcision, and he was circumcised. You know what? The Bible is really a double blessing to your life. I mean, it really is. Because first, it is a record of what God has said But second, the Holy Spirit moves in you as you study God's Word. Because as you study God's Word, then the Holy Spirit individualizes certain principles and He personalizes certain promises. So God's Word is a tangible entity that prepares you to stand in spiritual warfare and defeat the devil with your life. But it's also truth made real in your spirit by the Holy Spirit so that you can activate it in your life and receive the blessings of faith. And third, and I must hurry, third, saving faith has a definite goal. Abraham's faith was counted as the righteousness of God apart from human works. You see that in verses 4 and 5. We already read that. You see it in verses 22 to 25. Real, authentic faith is always redemptive. Your suffering is not always redemptive, but your faith is. Why? Because it leads us to God's righteousness instead of our own. So the dynamic of faith is that it believes God will perform everything he promises. And it abandons all attempts to merit anything from God on our own and apart from trusting him. It believes Jesus Christ is the only way of salvation. And all we have to do is trust in his name. And in the final analysis, this is number four, saving faith has an eternal result. Everything about Abraham changed as he continued to walk with God and exercise faith in trusting his word and act on his power in the Holy Spirit. Everything about Jacob was changed. Everything about Moses was changed. Everything about David was changed. Everything about Paul was changed. Everything about the disciples was changed. When they continued to walk with God and exercise faith by trusting in his word and acting in the power of his spirit. You do not need counseling. You need transformation because even if your counseling doesn't bring you to transformation, it it ain't no good. You don't need psychotherapy. You need a new personality. You don't need to be more of you. You need to be who God created you to be in Jesus Christ. We see that all through Romans chapter 4. Because biblical, authentic, dynamic, saving faith always produces a transformed life when it is followed over time. How do I know that Abraham's faith really transformed his life? Well, look at it on your handout. Hebrews chapter 11. Look at Hebrews 11, verse 17. By faith, Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac. And he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called. Accounting, why did he do that? You know what? Abraham wasn't even connecting it to the pagan practices of the idolatrous people around him. He wasn't even connecting it to the idea that, well, you know, a lot of gods tell you to do human sacrifice. No, nothing like that. Verse 19 tells us Abraham was accounting that God was able to raise Isaac up even from the dead. From whence he received him in a figure. So God calls Abraham to take his beloved son, his only son, and offer him back to God as a sacrifice because Abraham, he did that because he believed that God quickens the dead. Abraham saw the invisible. He heard the inaudible, and he was convinced God could do the impossible, so much so that only an angel stopped Abraham's hand from slaying Isaac. 
Abraham had to be saying in his heart as he raised that knife to take his son's life, God, I don't know how you're going to do this. It seems like a contradiction to what you promised. And yet I know that the promise was your word, just like I know that this command for me to do this is your word. And I trust the very same God in both places. I believe you're going to keep all your promises, even if you've got to raise my son from the dead to do it. Do you believe that God will keep all his promises even if he has to do it after your resurrection? See, that is the faith that will transform your life right now. If you're not living and walking in that kind of faith, you do not have authentic, dynamic, biblical, saving faith. Every head bowed, every eye closed. You know, the devil has wreaked so much havoc in so many lives and in so many churches. I mean, he started, well, he didn't just start in 2020, but boy, did, did, did he ever hit us in 2020. And 2021 20, has not begun that much better. One positive thing is how clearly it shows us that we are in the end times in our own age. But the one question you need to answer this morning is this. Do you have saving faith in Jesus? Is Christ your object of faith? What the Bible says and not what some pastor, priest, or parent has said. Is God's promise of eternal life the foundation for you? Is that faith so real you know that you've been redeemed? And you're willing now to continue and be baptized and get discipled because you know that you're saved and you know that that faith, if you let it, it will transform your life. You know, all you have to do is pray. Just pray and say, God, I want to be born again. I want to start becoming in Christ the person you created me to be in the gospel, the person you're creating me to be by being born again. Jesus, I will never be ashamed of you. So here, I give you my life. And if you pray like that, or you, if you've already prayed and been saved, but you want to be baptized, or you've been baptized, but you're a member of another church, you want to join our church, or if you want to get discipled or any other spiritual help or assistance that you need, come forward to the front and let us know, or call, text, or email us and let us know. I want to give you a copy of my book, Next Steps for New Believers. Go ahead and stand and let's have a word of prayer. Father, I thank you this morning for your word. What a great setup to have just four weeks out from Easter. I mean, this is, this is like the rocket that's going to take off and this is like ignition that goes to the engines and it hasn't quite been released yet and the hooks are still on it, allowing it to build up thrust. But Lord, we believe you got great things for us this Easter. Great things that you're going to do. And so, Father, I pray, Lord, give, us, give me power to preach. Lord, I ask, give us a movement of the Holy Spirit in our lives starting today and carrying us all the way through. And Lord, let us have a working Easter by way of what we can do in our harvest teams to get ourselves ready and share our testimony and get other people invited to either, either come with us or watch online and and Lord, help us to work practically in our community. In this case, just happening to support, it just happens that we are able to support within our own community, someplace that helps both adults and children who were victims of, self tra of, of sex trafficking survive. Helps them survive because Lord, so many who are in that can't get out of it, feel like they can't because they have no place to go, they have nothing else to do. And uh, so, Lord, we thank you that we can offer that hope to them as well as the hope of the gospel. So be with us now, Lord. Begin setting us up starting from this Sunday. Lord, we just, we look to you to work through, uh, through us, not because of who we are, but because of our faith that it's in you. We ask in Jesus' precious and powerful name, Amen. If you need any spiritual help or assistance, come here to the front. See you back tonight for our prayer service in Awana. Stay in the Bible, share the gospel. Love you. Have a great week. You're dismissed. <laughs>